Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining today's webinar. I'd like to introduce Mark Fleck, who will be today's presenter. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you all for joining this webinar about high pressure processing. This is one in a series of webinars planned to advance the adoption of HPP, a fast growing food preservation technology using the simple pressure of water. Today's webinar is sponsored by Universal Pasteurization. As a fellow RFA member, we are always looking for ways to engage with the group. Our webinars serve to educate members and highlight companies that are leveraging HPP to expand their businesses. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Chris Stout, Vice President of Chairman's Foods. You will hear how Chris and his team use HPP to address their customers' needs for fresh, high-quality, refrigerated product offerings. Welcome, Chris. Uh, good morning, Mark. Thank you for having me. I'm your host, Mark Fleck. I've been involved with the HPP community for about 16 years. I had the opportunity to engage with many of the early adopters, people like Hormel, Alamex Pressurized Foods, Costco, HEB, and Virginia Tech. These organizations wanted to learn about HPP and figure out how to unlock the value of this new food preservation technology. In 2012, I joined Universal Pasteurization in Lincoln, Nebraska. Universal had purchased five large vessels and offered HPP outsourcing in addition to their cold storage services. In an application development sales role, we expanded their HPP service business. Today, Universal has four HPP centers strategically located around the country. In one housekeeping note, towards the end of the webinar, there will be a time for Q&A. Please submit your questions via chat located on the right side of your screen. Uh, let's dig in. So what is HPP? For some of you, HPP is a new technology. Let's take a moment to do a short overview. HPP is a cold pasteurization process that addresses vegetative bacteria and many spoilage organisms. HPP often becomes a critical control point in our customers' HACCP programs. HPP maintains food's optimal organoleptic qualities, including flavor, texture, and appearance, while at the same time preserving vitamins and nutrients. So how does HPP work? Prepackaged food is loaded into carrier baskets, and the baskets are pushed into the cylindrical vessel. This vessel is sealed and pressurized up to 87,000 PSI, 600 megapascal, using potable water. The pressure is isostatic, which is another way of saying equal pressure from all sides. Think of a grape in a plastic water bottle. You squeeze the bottle, the bottle applies pressure to the water, and the water applies pressure on the grape equally from all sides. In this batch process, the product is held at pressure for anywhere from one to six minutes, depending on the HPP recipe. The cellular function of the bacteria and the spoilage organisms are disrupted. HPP is considered the log reduction food preservation technology, meaning that the higher the pressure and the longer the hold time, the greater the reduction of microorganisms. In contrast to heat pasteurization, HPP is effective virtually instantaneously, both on the surface and all the way through the product. This next slide is for future reference, another schematic of how HPP works, along with additional details about the process. Packaging is key to a component, key component of the HPP process. Millions of pounds of food products are HPP'd every day, many existing packaging formats work well with HPP. For example, deli cups, both flats and stand-up pouches, plastic bottles, chubs, and trays are all packaging formats used successfully with HPP. There are several requirements for packaging that must be met. One is that the package must be hermetically sealed, meaning airtight. At least one surface must be flexible to accommodate the temporary volume change. Any headspace will be compressed first, and then the package will be compressed up to 15%, depending on the HPP parameters. 
As the cycle ends and the pressure is released, the package returns to its pre-HPP volume. To maximize the additional shelf life gained with HPP, we want to pay attention to the barrier properties of the packaging materials. For example, oxygen transmission rate, OTR, and the moisture vapor transmission rate, the uh, MVTR properties. In discovering the world of HPP, some of the earliest applications for HPP included sliced ready-to-eat meats, guacamole, salsa, and oysters. Today we see HPP used with wet salads, dips, dressings, baby foods, ready meals, and even raw pet foods. HPP is not a silver bullet. Products that are not good candidates include those with low water activity, such things as flour or honey or peanut butter, products with a lot of entrained air, bread would be a good example, and products in a frozen state. Here we highlight some of the early, some of the HPP adopters in the refrigerated food space. Garden Fresh Gourmet has a line of salsa and hummus products. The company was purchased in 2015 by Campbell's. Good Foods Group is a Wisconsin-based company which offers a line of guacamole, dips, salads, and sips. Perfect Fit Meals produces convenient, ready-to-eat meals. And Pure Spoon introduced a line of refrigerated baby foods. Sandridge Foods is an Ohio company that manufactures wet salads, dips, spreads, and sides. So let's talk about how to unlock the value of HPP. There are three principal reasons we want to consider HPP. One is to enhance our food safety programs. Second, to increase the product shelf life and third, the ability to introduce new innovative products. Some producers, retailers, and QSRs use HPP to protect their brand. Or your customer may want to convert distribution from frozen to fresh. Others are searching for ideas for product differentiation, for instance, cleaner label products or products with reduced sodium. Because Shelf life can often be doubled with HPP. Value is added in other ways, including larger distribution networks, less discounting, and reduced product waste. The bottom line, there are many reasons one may want to consider HPP. Today, we have the opportunity to learn how Chris and his team and chairman capped HPP's benefits to help grow their business. Chris, thanks for joining the conversation. Uh, good morning. And, Thank you, Mark. Uh, Chris, my name is share, yeah, go yeah. ahead. If you can share with us a little bit about your company and the HPP journey. Sure, absolutely. Yes, uh, good morning. My name is Chris Stout. Uh, I run a food manufacturing business here in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, we've been operating in the food service industry for uh, going on 50 years now. Torian and Mark and the good folks at uh, Universal have asked me to talk about our journey to HPP and how it's helped bring our business to where it is today. To begin, I'd like to give a brief history of Chairman's Foods and a little bit about what we do. And of course, I'll talk a little bit about HPP and how it's impacted our business as we've gone forward. Our story began as a custom processing plant for a national multi-unit family dining restaurant chain. Uh, we started by producing and packing food products specifically to support the demand for safe, quality, and consistent food for the high volume chain. Obviously, the quality and safety controls were important benefits that came with controlling the food supply, but the real driver was consistency. Where our company is today is a result of sheer determination and cumulative focus on finding solutions for unique supply chain challenges. These challenge all, challenges always revolve around creating, developing, and delivering food products that are safe, easy to prepare and serve, and most importantly, have the quality and consistency that impacts the brand positively. Uh, large food service brand names, whether it be restaurants or grocery stores, they all live and die by their reputation on the quality and consistency of the food that we supply them. Uh, supplying for thousand plus restaurants with uh, fresh coleslaw all over the country each week or making a 
hundred year old recipe for clam chowder and distributing it, distributing it fresh, uh, developing signature pie fillings and sauces that must be just right, taste like they came out of grandma's kitchen, even though it was produced and packed several months ahead of time in a commercial kitchen. These challenges taught us to be uh, who we are, taught us to add value to our products, our customers. It taught us how to be flexible, nimble, and gave us the opportunity to find niche opportunities to fill and to drive our business forward. Over our history, we've experienced with many different methods and techniques to cook, chill, package, and distribute our products. We produce products that fall under both USDA and FDA regulation. We're SQF Level 3 certified plant. We're self-regulated and driven by the purpose to develop and distribute safe, quality foods to our customers. Our processing methods are traditionally thermal, heat-treated processing techniques. We use steam-jacketed kettles to cook and immersion water bath chillers to chill soups, sauces, fillings, casserole bases. Uh, traditional hot fill, heat-treated packing process to, to help preserve product from spoilage and to eliminate pathogens. We also employ sous vide cook, cooking techniques to prepare items such as meatloaf, cooked chicken breast, pulled pork, and even southern style green beans, one of my favorites. The sous vide method or vacuum packed and then cooked in low heat, uh, sustained time frames allow to prepare wholesome, clean label center of the plate proteins that reheat to moist and savory food products for our customers. This method is similar to HPP in that it's a post-pack lethality step that allows products longer, fresher shelf life without the additional uh, addition of chemical preservatives. However, cooking a product is intended to change the structure and outcome, while HPP has no negative effect to the product structure or integrity. It really just makes it stay fresh longer. Uh, Chairman's Foods, we also have a ready-to-eat blending and packing process inside of our operation where we produce ready-to-eat wet salads like chicken salad, tuna salad, pasta salad. Uh, being true Southerners, we also produce a lot of cornbread stuffing each year, especially during the holidays. This is where we utilize HPP as a solution for extended shelf life requirements and supply chain demands. This category here uh, where the ready-to-eat products are uh, has has many success stories and has really exploded over the past several years that are in large part due to the availability and access to HPP nowadays. Another piece of the puzzle for Chairman's is the packaging process and the packaging we use to sustain and protect our delicate food products. We've been using cryovac roll stock food grade films for years. We utilize vertical and horizontal form fill packaging equipment to pack our food, uh, pack our cooked items and items that we cook in the vacuum packed pouches. We also use polypropylene tubs with clear lid film for our ready to eat salads and dips. Uh, the packaging process or the packing process is where we add value, where we find ways to help our customers meet their unique challenges. Multi-part fill, thermoformed packages, sealed and lidded, chilled and or frozen, weight specific, par cooked, fully cooked, heat treated, ready to eat, multi-component kit packing, built for distribution. That's what we're doing. Uh, these are all very critical and important to our customers. We take the work out of the customer's hands. We provide them with these products to allow them to focus on customer service and product sales. <clears throat> In the last eight years, we've evolved into primarily a refrigerated foods producer. At one time, out of this facility, we were 100% uh, of the product that we made was packed and distributed frozen. It's now less than 40% of our total business. The demand and need for refrigerated, fresh products is continuing to grow, and now with a vehicle such as HPP, I foresee that opportunity with, will continue to expand as well. Um, our journey with HPP began in 2010 out of need. Our challenge was a practical challenge was about supply chain and logistical obstacles that needed to be addressed. Our customer needed a fresh product and it needed to be delivered nationally in large volume each week with upwards of 30 days of shelf life upon receipt. <clears throat> we had been producing this product for several years and the customer asked us to put two fully cooked components together, provide it fresh 
to simplify their operational challenge at the store level. The difficulty was to keep the ingredients from causing spoilage and to maintain integrity for an extended period. Our traditional methods would not be enough to meet this challenge. Um, and about that time, we were introduced to HPP by one of our supplier partners. And we began doing our own diligence uh, and finding ways to apply this to our challenges. We were very fortunate during that time to meet Mark Fleck, um, as well as having a Viewer Technologies, a HPP equipment supplier, move their corporate headquarters to Franklin, Tennessee, just down the road from our facility. While we were doing our test, testing, we were able to work with some of the incredible people such as Dr. Errol Radberg and others in the scientific field that gave us excellent insight and resources to help educate us on HPP. Our test and the additional resources that, we, that were provided gave us plenty of validation that we needed to utilize this technology. We tested a lot of product that we had HPP'd versus our traditional use of functional preservative ingredients. What we found that was for, our, for several of our products, HPP provided a very distinct difference in the performance of our products and also that it was, very, that it was virtually cost neutral. We had to learn how HPP impacts food and how to apply it. Uh, we learned that HPP inactivates foodborne pathogens and spoilage organisms. It's a non-thermal process that does not negatively impact taste, texture, or the appearance. We tested proteins, fresh vegetables, cornbread stuffings, dips, salads, spreads. We've abused cranberries and apples. We have put the pressure quotation marks, we've put the pressure to all types of materials, and we've not found a significant difference in anything we've ever tried in regards to taste, texture, or visual appearance from products that have been HPP. <clears throat> it eliminates the need for costly chemical additives, antimicrobial agents that really no one wants in their food anyway. Uh, and we also determined that uh, because of those additional ingredients that the uh, uh, HPP process actually became uh, cost neutral uh, by removing those ingredients. Uh, it significantly extends the shelf life and it reduces spoilage cost, which is another uh, big impact to the cost of the product that we provide. So what is the impact on cost? That's really where we spent a lot of time uh, and where it really falls into play is the uh, cost are attributed, the additional cost are attributed to the logistics involved in using the toll provider such as Universal. We, uh, we first looked into HPP um, and purchasing it for our own production facility. Um, the, the problem with uh, bringing in HPP or the challenge with bringing an HPP vessel into your, to your own facility, obviously there's space and accessibility issues a very heavy uh, capital expenditure to get into, uh, and there are a lot of new process challenges that uh, that are new to our our uh, business and, and operation, and would uh, have additional resources um, that we'd need to manage that. So, in in lies the opportunity where Universal Pasteurization and their their facilities to toll uh, our products and use use their facilities. Um, basically as a logistical provider uh, based on their geography. We use them on the way to the customer. So we produce the product here, we ship it to Universal, they process it with HPP, and then we ship that product from their facility directly to our customer. By allowing and use, utilizing Universal's infinite resources in food science, technology, and their capacity, and especially their customer service and, and desire to uh, be a, a positive impact to your product and your brand um, has been able to save us our resources so that we can apply those to, to other business needs. Quite simply, our logistical process is we produce and pack uh, here in Nashville, Tennessee, and then we ship that product uh, on the second day out to uh, Universal Pasteurization in one of their locations. Um, by the third day, that product has been uh, processed with HPP, and we're able to ship it four days later from the date of production um, on LTL carriers all over the country to, uh, to our customers. It's taking about six days average transit, what allows us to, to make and produce and deliver nationally within 10 days. 
utilizing HPP is critical to that process. And all these costs are attributed to the, uh, the logistical cost in, in, uh, involved, and that's where we have really spent most of our work in, in trying to find uh, ways to apply this technology uh, and keep that cost uh, valuable for our customers. And Mark, that's about, uh, about where I'm at. All right, Chris, thank you for sharing your journey with the audience today. It's uh, most appreciative. Got a couple of uh, additional questions. Um, has HPP uh, opened up any new markets for you, customers perhaps that you were not doing business with previously? Absolutely. We're typically a food service, traditionally a food service uh, player. We have uh, we've worked uh, behind the scenes with a lot of food service um brands, restaurants, as well as grocery store chains, and um, allowing us into the retail segment, uh, HPP being able to provide fresh products for the retail segment have absolutely opened up doors for us uh, outside of that typical traditional food service segment. Sounds real good. Hey, Toyin, uh, do you have some additional questions that may have come in from the audience? Yes. I do. So uh, thanks for sharing your journey, Chris. Thank you, Mark. Right now we have a few questions from the audience, um, and as more questions come in, um, please go ahead and put those in the chat box. So the first question um, is, we've been told that products destined for HPP must have a pH of less than 4.6, and this must be included in the HACCP program. Is that correct? Chris, do you want to comment, or I can take this one? Go ahead, Mark. You can speak to the pH for sure. All right. Yeah, the pH uh, is a important characteristic of any product, and in particular, this question, question typically comes up in talking about beverages. Uh, FDA has a five-log uh, reduction rule that uh, beverage producers um, if they're using HPP or other non-thermal pasteurization technologies, um, need to be concerned about the possibility, the potential of Clostridium botulinum. It's a spore that uh, HPP is not effective against, and so the hurdle that many beverage producers are using would be to keep that pH below 4.6, which inhibits the growth of CBOT spores. Great, thanks, Mark. And actually, the second question is somewhat related. So the question is, you know, the FDA is concerned um, about sea botulism in refrigerated foods, packaged in pouches, or film-sealed containers. How do you address this perceived hazard? Again, uh, you know, there's a number of hurdles that customers can use to uh, ensure food safety. Uh, pH being one of those, and there's a variety of acid acidulants that can be added to a product and to help to adjust the pH. Uh, water activity is another characteristic that um, certain organisms will not grow under uh, water activity levels below certain, le certain points. Uh, there's uh, just a whole variety of different types of ingredients. Um, a lot of the flavorings work very synergistically with HPP. And so there are a, a variety of techniques that we can work with customers in addressing those issues. It's a little hard, it's a bit of a generalization at this point, so if that uh, audience member who posed that question uh, would want to talk with us in more detail about their specific product and their needs, uh, let's have them do that, uh, get in contact with us after the webinar. Great, thanks Mark. Switching gears a little bit, Chris earlier talked about a lot of product testing that they did. Um, so the question is for Mark, how do you go about getting validation studies done? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's really uh, two things that you want to uh, pay attention to. One is, are you using the technology HPP for shelf life extension only, or are you using it uh, as, as a method to address uh, food safety? If the fact that you're going to be using the technology to address a food safety concern 
then it is advisable that you have a challenge study done on the organism, the microorganism that, uh, that you're concerned about, whether it be E. coli 157, uh, Listeria, Salmonella, Campylobacter, or whatever it is. So there is a network of companies out there, uh, a viewer, uh, Chris mentioned a viewer working with a viewer. There are universities, there are a variety of uh, testing labs or micro labs that we can work with in doing those challenge studies if that challenge study is not already in the public domain. So the key is understanding which microorganisms that are of concern to you on your particular products and then making sure that the proper HPP parameters are set so that we get the correct log reduction of those microorganisms in your product. But yes, we can work with uh, any of the uh, customers in, in going through that journey, through that process of uh, challenge studies and or shelf life studies. Thanks, Mark. This next question is for Chris, and the audience member wants to know, do you have a couple pieces of advice for any manufacturers that are getting started on the HPP journey? Oh sure. Well, first of all, take your first step. That's the uh, uh, that's the first uh, first thing I would say. The uh, first step in, in in working with folks here at Universal, uh, these guys are an unlimited resource uh, for questions as they come up. Uh, if they don't have the answer, uh, which they do most of the time, uh, then they are uh, they're usually available and quick to find uh, find a way to uh, to help out. <clears throat> Second piece of advice I'd give you is in developing your products, specifically in what Mark was just talking about. We are, we've, we've been producing our products for a lot of years and we have uh, HACCP-based principles obviously through our, throughout our process. The uh, critical control points that we use in our process to, to produce the foods are, um, are still in play. We employ HPP specifically for uh, shelf life extension and so we develop our products that way so there are I'm sure there are plenty of opportunities to use HPP as a critical control point and as a part of your process step uh, we use it specifically to develop uh, and give us shelf life extension so in developing products uh, is really where you got to start with uh, your HPP process and, and getting on board with with HPP and then the second, the third thing I would say from advice is that we we use HPP as a logistical step. Uh, it's a part of our supply chain, and as I said before, we we make it as a uh, as a shelf life extension so that we can get the products in that fresh form, refrigerated, chilled form, uh, to our customers nationally uh, with shelf life, with extended shelf life, which is what they need to get through the supply chain. So I guess all in all, my, to summarize, my, uh, my advice would be to uh, begin with the development process of your product in thinking about how you're going to deliver to your customer with that shelf life that they need um, and, and using HPP as that shelf life extension step uh, as a part of your logistical process. Thanks, Chris. That's great. Um, actually, this next question is for you as well. Um, audience member wants to know if you're observing your customers inquiring directly about HPP, and then do you have any thoughts on um, how the value of HPP can be effectively messaged more within the food and beverage industry? Yeah, that's a great uh, it's a great question. Um, first, uh, HPP is uh, widely recognized uh, within the industry as being a uh, uh, a great opportunity. However, a lot of people don't know the details behind it, and so I guess just the understanding of it uh, would be the first first step. And I believe there's been a lot of work done, especially over the past uh, year, in creating a, a marketing campaign so that more people can understand what HPP really is and uh, and how clean that process is. Uh, so yeah, I believe that uh, HPP, just by having that in our repertoire, uh, has absolutely uh, been a, uh, a positive impact for us to uh, to reach uh, uh, opportunities that uh, weren't currently uh, before reachable. 
um, and uh, and people know enough about it that uh, uh, that there's excitement generated by it, um, and um, and there's there's definitely a lot of interest from our customers uh, in exploring options where we can apply HPP. Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, Mark, a question for you, uh, just a general question about how HPP impacts dairy-based products. Uh, that's a big question, Toyin. <laughs> um, HPP is already used in a variety of uh, dairy-based products. Uh, one example that comes to mind is the Bolt House yogurt-based dressing that's been in the marketplace for a while. and um, Bolt House looked at using HPP. One is to produce a cleaner label product, but you know, in particular, they were interested. Uh, like, to give you an example, their um, blue cheese yogurt-based dressing. They liked HPP because it maintained the integrity of the blue cheese chunks in the dressing, and so there were uh, that, and then also it improved the mouthfeel of the product. Uh, through the HPP process. So there were a number of reasons that um, they chose HPP for that product line, that new product line. There's also a fair number of applications in dips that include dairy-based dairy products, um, cheeses. In fact, we just had an inquiry yesterday about uh, HPPing some soft cheeses. Soft cheeses have a little higher water activity, and uh, by soft cheese, I mean like Mexican-style cheese, et cetera. But uh, they have a little higher water activity, and uh, conditions are such that it would allow for microbial growth quicker than in a, uh, in a dry cheese. So there are quite a number of applications that uh, either are in, already in the market or being tested in the dairy segment. And again, uh, for specifics, uh, just have them get, get in contact with us, and we can work through the details with them. Why aren't you still there? Yes, yes. Um, so we run over a couple of minutes. So I do want to just get in one more question that we have. And then for anybody who has further questions after the webinar, uh, we do have a couple of email addresses that we're going to share with you so that you can pose your questions and we'll definitely get right back to you. But Mark, last question is, how do regulatory agencies view HPP? Yeah, and, and that's a great question. Um, in the case of uh, FD, well, let's talk in general. In general, most all of the regulatory agencies, both in the U.S. and actually worldwide now, are familiar with uh, HPP. We've spent a lot of time over the years just uh, introducing the concept and then uh, developing uh, documentation, uh, challenge studies, shelf life studies, et cetera that uh, substantiate the effectiveness of HPP on vegetative bacteria and uh, spoilage organisms. In uh, drilling down just another level to the FDA uh, on the uh, juice HACCP rule, uh, they specifically mention HPP as an acceptable technology, intervention technology or hurdle to be used on uh, beverages. Um, USDA is such that uh, you have your HACCP program if uh, HPP is a critical control point in that HACCP plan, then you need to have documentation supporting the effectiveness of the technology of HPP on your product. And so that would be part of the documentation that you would have as a producer of a product that is governed by uh, USDA. Great, thanks Mark. I'd um, like to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, thanks again to Mark and Chris uh, for all the information you shared. For everybody who has registered, we will send you a link that has the presentation slides and the audio so you can watch back, share the information with your team. Like I mentioned prior, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. You can email, email us info at ucsne.com or you can email Mark Fleck directly at mfleck at ucsne.com, and that contact information will be shared with you once again within the next 48 hours. So thanks again, everybody, for joining, and we will hear from everybody at our next webinar.